In this lecture, we're going to be looking at linked lists, and I'm going to do it using this file. It's called Playground, and it's in the ALGS 1.3 package. When you open this file, you'll see immediately on line 5, there's a declaration of a node named first. And then on line 6, there's a declaration of a node class. The node class has two fields, item and next, and it has a constructor which accepts the item and next and assigns the parameters to the fields. When you run a program and build out the structure in memory, they're going to look like I'm showing over here on the right. What you can see is that I have two structures called list1 and list2. Those structures have a type. Each of them is a playground. So there's the class playground here. I have two instances of that type. Um, so the variables here are called list1 pointing to this playground here and list2 pointing to this playground here. The playgrounds each have a field called first and you can see that on line 5. The type of first, it's a pointer to a node. The first node of the first playground is 5, which you can see here. You can see how list 1 represents the list of elements 5, 11, 5, 5, and how list 2 here represents the list 24, 35, 67. The first list has four nodes. Each node holds one element of data, and those elements are in the order we would expect. So first a 5, then the 11, then two 5s. Likewise for list 2, we have three data items, and therefore we have three nodes, and they are in the order we expect, 24, 35, 67. I've marked the node class as static on line 6. In your textbook, the authors prefer not to do this. I have marked the class static because it avoids some unnecessary pointers in the pictures. To see this, let me remove the keyword static and show you what happens. So I'll remove it here. Um, a few edits are necessary to get the code to compile once you've done that. But when you run it, what you'll find is you end up with a picture like this. So um, if you look at it, you can see the main program still has list 1 and list 2. In this, in this case, the objects are called a playground with non-static node, not simply a playground. And the first is pointing to the node. Note the node always has a this dollar zero pointing back to the playground. And this is consistent for all of the nodes. They're all going to have a pointer back to the creating object. This is the meaning of the word static on a class. When you have a non-static class, you have a pointer to the surrounding object or the creating object. And when you have a static class, you do not have that pointer. Um, for our nodes, we don't need to have that pointer to the outer object. And so I'm going to write the code without using that pointer. And therefore, I'll mark the code as having a static node. To see how lists are created, it's handy to use a simpler creator than the of method, which I have defined here. The of method is quite fancy. It takes a string and parses all of the numbers and creates nodes corresponding to those numbers. It's very convenient for developing tests and playing around with um, lists, but it's also kind of difficult to understand. So I'll start by looking at a much simpler example, which is written here. So let me just run this. The code begins at line 34 by invoking the method example. The example method takes one parameter and then starts creating nodes. On line 17, we create a node with item 11 and next equal to null. This is done by invoking the constructor, but 
The constructor doesn't do anything except copy its parameters into the fields. So you can see here I'm just skipping that in the display. Once I've constructed the node with item 11 and next equal to null, I'll return that back to the example and save it as a very in a variable called x1. So once we're done here, x1 is a pointer to a node with item 11. Then we'll repeat this with x2, having a node with item 21. x3 will have 31. x4 will have 41. So once I've created all my nodes, I can then create a playground to put them all together. So when I create a playground, I'm going to create an object that has a first field. So here's my playground. Note that first is initially null. So if you don't specify a value or a constructor, then Java will initialize the fields all to their zero value, which is null for objects. When I return here, I now have my playground object called result, and I have four nodes. So what we need to do is to stitch them together. So on line 22 here, I will set the result first to be equal to x1. So that should be this node, x1, which is now result first. Note that this doesn't create a new node object. All it does is uh, copy the reference. This is an alias result.first and x1 refer to the same object in memory. I'm going to do this again on line 23. I'm going to set x1.next to be equal to x2. So we're going to take the object with value 21 here and stitch it after the object with value 11. We can continue this on line 24 to take the object with item 31 and put it after the object with value 21. And finally, on line 25, we'll take the object with item 41 and put it after 31. At this point, I've actually created the correct structure. I have my playground first pointing to 11, then next to 21, next to 31, next to 41. At this point, the code can return, and I've got the list I wanted. Note that all of the temporary variables, the local variables of the example field, the parameter i, all of them are deallocated when the function returns. All of that goes away. But I'm returning the result. The result is this playground. Therefore, it and all of the objects that are reachable from it will stay alive. So they are returned as a return value. Back in main one, I then stitch that in um, for my first list. Now I'm going to repeat this twice again. So I'll have another one with 15, 25, etc. Then we'll have another one with 17, 27, etc. And in the end, we have then three linked lists. Example one, example two, and example three. Finally, on line 38, the code prints the item. And you can see it there in the console. The item it's printing is x.item, where x is example.first. So I'm going to example, excuse me, example one dot first. That is the node with item 11, and I'm then printing out 11. It's worth playing around with this and trying to print different things. So let's do some experimenting here without actually redrawing the picture. I just want to play around with the pointers. So I'm going to comment out run and run the code. And you'll see it actually, it's getting me 11. Um, one thing to note is that I could also do example two here. And what I expect to get out at this point is example two's first item, which would be 15. And indeed, that works. Um, I could also get example two's second item. 
So there's many ways to do that, but one of them is to just write next here. And now my node X is actually going to point to the, this item here. So if I run this um, there, you can see it. Here you can see in the picture that X is indeed pointing to the second node of example two. Um, you can play this game as much as you want. So I can go to the last element by stringing along um, three next pointers. And if I run this, I'll get a new picture here, which I can then look at, just go to the end. And you can see indeed X is pointing to the last element. Uh, what happens if I try to set next dot next again after this one? Um, well, I'm gonna end up with a problem if I try to print out this item. So I'm not gonna print out the item, I'll just print out um, X. But let's just see what X's value will be if I do this. And to see it, we can just look at the pictures. And you can see here X at this point is null. Well, that makes sense because X was pointing to the last item. So X next is null, and that's the value you get. If I try to dereference a null pointer, I'll get a runtime exception. And you can see that here. I'm gonna get a null pointer exception on line 38. What's happening here? Well, it means that X is null. You only get a null pointer exception when something on the left-hand side of the dot operator is null. So on this line, it's really clear. There's only one dot operator, so it has to be X. And indeed, X is null. Null pointer exceptions are very similar to array index out of bounds exceptions for array-based data structures. A null pointer exception typically means you're trying to go beyond or before or, or somehow reference the structure in an invalid way. That's roughly how lists are created. We'll talk more about array creation next week. But for now, I really want to concentrate on how you use a list that's already been created in order to compute something. And the simplest thing for us to do is to just go through the elements of a list and look at each one and then do some processing on it. So I just want to look at how you do that. So let's suppose we want to compute num fives on, let's say, the list on the left. That's five, 11, five, five. Well, if we're going to be computing this, like usual, we'll start assuming that we're somewhere in the middle of the list. So let's suppose we're pointing at the second to last element. That's the, the second five. Um, so let's suppose we're here. What do I need to know? Well, clearly I need to know where I am. So we need a variable um, to keep track of where we are. We also need some sort of notation for keeping track of how many fives we've seen so far. And um, my favorite name for those kind of things would be just sort of result. So that's how many fives I've seen so far and some notion of where I am. And then in my loop, what I'm gonna do is go around and make a, make a step of progress. So how do I make progress here? Well, the first thing I need to do is look at the item I'm at right now. So I'm going to interrogate um, x dot item. So this is the notation for looking at the item pointed to by x. It's just like when we use an array, um, we would say uh, a of i, you know, sort of the in the array where the ith element in a linked uh, list, we say through the pointer, look at the item. That's the value it points to. So once I've got that, I can say, well, is it five or not? And if it is five, then I need to increment um, the result, for example. That does the computation for this step, but then I need to move forward. So how do I move forward? Well, I need to update my X pointer. So I'm gonna update the X pointer to have it point to x dot next. Once I've done that then, that looks like I'll make progress. How am I gonna stop here? Well, I wanna stop when I hit null. So whenever x gets to be null, I better not look at x dot item because if I look at x dot item when x is null, I'll get a null pointer exception. So I'll do this as long as x is not equal to null.
So there's my loop. It's looking pretty good. What do I need to do? I just need to uh, return the result at the end. And I also need to uh, figure out how I'm going to start this guy. So you'll see I'm getting some errors, and the errors are just that the value may not be initialized. So I need to pick initial values. Um, well, do I need to do anything special at the beginning here? No, I have a good zero value for this problem, which is I'll just pick the result initially to be zero, and I can then set my node pointer to point to the first node. So the way I write that is I just say this dot first. So now I have x uh, pointing to uh, this dot first, and I will continue through and run. For consistency with my slides, I'm going to edit this a little bit to shrink up the constructor so that my num5's method starts on the line 11. And let's just look at what happens as num5 starts to execute. The first important thing to notice is that we invoked num5's with list 1 on line 28. That means that the special variable this is bound to list 1 when we execute the method. Indeed, you can see that list 1 holds the values 5, 11, 5, 5, and when we invoke nums 5s, this is pointing to that playground. When we start the method, we first initialize result to 0, then we initialize the pointer variable x to point to the first node, then we start the loop. If x is not null, we look at x.item and increment. Here x is not null. We're pointing to an actual node, so we will go to line 15, check the item. We see that it is a 5, so we'll increment the result. And now on line 16, we move x. So what are we going to do here? Well, we follow x to find the next pointer. It's pointing to this object, so we are going to copy the pointer here back. Sometimes this step is a little fast for people, so let me split it up into two parts. What I'm going to do here is on line 16, I'm going to copy x.next into a new variable called y. What is that going to do? It's going to create a new variable that refers to x.next. Then I'm going to copy the value of y into x. What is that going to do? Well, it has the effect of moving x forward. So now x is where y was. Going back to the original code, we have x pointing to the second item. Now going around the loop, we'll check to see if that item has a 5. In this case, it does not, so we'll simply move on to the next item. Again, we'll check it. We're not null. The item is 5 in this case, so we will increment the result and move on. The way we move on is, of course, to set x to be x.next. And as we keep moving through our list, um, we'll see another 5. We'll increment the result. And now we're going to set x to be x.next. But note that next here is not a pointer to an object. It is null. And what does that mean? It means I'm going to copy the null value into x. And x is no longer pointing anywhere, so I don't draw it as a pointer. It's instead the value null. And at this point, line 14 will terminate the loop. So we will go on to line 18 and we can return the result. So this is how NumFives computes in a loop.